that's a new theme. I put that together courtesy of the app called Splice. Uh, very nicely done. I couldn't use an actual song I wanted to because our friends over at Copyright would not allow that to happen. And that made me welcome you to episode 161 of the Mike the New Haven podcast. We have a great guest tonight. I'll get to him momentarily. Uh, if you have not checked out the previous episode, that, of course, was volume two of Talk to Me, Life on the NYPD's hostage negotiation team with retired NYPD hostage, hostage negotiation detective, first grade Christian Flood. So he was a great guy to talk to. It's a newer miniseries that we started on the show, but the more and more we do of those shows, the better and stronger that miniseries will get. And we're off to a strong start with it, having had Jack Cambria and, of course, Christian on for that series. So I'll get to my guest in a moment uh, for 161, but I do want to begin tonight acknowledging the uh, sad news uh, over the weekend that I got over the passing of uh, my friend, retired NYPD detective, first grade Mordecai Janansky. Mordecai, if you didn't know him, uh, he was a detective in, in Midtown North for many, many years. Homicide, I believe. Very distinguished. He worked at Tora Task Force. He was originally from Brooklyn, I believe, started his career out there. OCCB as well. And then in 2002, when the NYPD's Counterterrorism Bureau was formed, Ray Kelly sent him out there to be a foreign liaison. And he worked in Israel, Tel Aviv, to be specific, for many years and did great work. Sadly, he died of a heart attack and, and he will be missed. And I send my condolences to Morty's family. Morty was a great guy and a heck of a guest. And if you want to go back a couple months to watch my episode with him, uh, please do so. Morty, uh, very sad loss. And uh, like I said, he will be missed. So tonight, uh, we welcome my next guest who served for 20 years as a proud officer and later sergeant in the New York City Police Department, joining the force in 1985. His career would see him gather intelligence on the underworld within Midtown Manhattan. And of course, police and protect the city's vast subway system, prevent and solve robberies, robberies excuse me. And lastly, uh, work under the police commissioner, Bernie Carrick, to be exact, as he'll discuss with me tonight. Just as busy in retirement, his work in the private sector certainly keeps him occupied these days. And that is one Jerry Kane, who joins us tonight on the Mike DeMaven podcast for 161 episode, that is. Jerry, welcome. How are you? Uh, thanks for having me, Mike. And that was very nice of you to mention uh, Morty at the beginning of the show. Morty was a great guy and uh, he's definitely gone too soon. And, oh, for uh, sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, so that's why, you know, life is not. Life is not a, a matter of guarantees. The next day is never guaranteed. So I know it sounds cliche, but if you got somebody in your life that means a lot to you that maybe you haven't talked to in a while, send that text. Give them a call. Let them know you're thinking of them because you just never know, uh, as we'll talk about uh, tonight in certain topics. So, Jerry, where would you grow up? First question isn't always an easy one. Where would you grow up? I, uh, I'm i sitting in zip code 11209, which is Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And I have been in this zip code my entire life in different addresses and uh different uh now my second house here in brooklyn and uh uh you know it's uh, i live not in the cool part of brooklyn like the hip part of brooklyn i live in a regular part of brooklyn where people put their garbage out on garbage night and shovel their sidewalk when it snows that, that kind of place and i love that because we were talking about that a little bit you know behind the scenes before we started tonight and that you see so and not that i'm not gonna when they get on the job, they don't usually stay in the city very long. If they still live in the city when they get on, they go out to Long Island, they go out to Rockland County. Or maybe, you know, if they lived in the city, they'll go out to Staten Island because it's a little bit quieter out there. Not you. You stayed in Brooklyn this entire time. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I like uh, what I like about city living is I can walk to all of the things that mean something to me. The nice steakhouse, the good Italian restaurant, the pub just to get a burger and watch a game, my bank, my dry cleaner, my church. My pharmacy, uh, I, you know, I don't have to, I'm not a slave to a car. Uh, I walk almost, uh, I walk around all the time. I'm pretty close to the subway. I can jump on a subway, head into Manhattan. Don't have to worry about driving, which is a real pain now with the construction on a BQE, which is going to be a nightmare for the next 10 years. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I, I, it's a great neighborhood. Bay Ridge is still a solid neighborhood. Uh, and uh, I, I, I love it here. And there are hotbeds for civil service in certain parts of New York. I've talked about it previously on the island. Massapequa's got a lot of guys that went into the PD and the FD and were volleys out on the island. Deer Park, for sure, as well. Your friend Joe Vigiano was from Deer Park, as well as his dad and his, and his brother John. But Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and Bill Ryan's, he knows this because he's in the chat, our mutual friend from Arson Explosion. Hi, Bill. Always good to see you, buddy. You know, he, he's a Bay Ridge guy, too. So many cops and firemen also grew up there. I think our friend Kenny Winkler from ESU was a Bay Ridge guy as well. Uh, why is that? And how did that inspire well, you? Uh, I think uh, uh, it was a kind of a working class neighborhood uh, after World War II. I know right. my parents uh, were from that generation. Uh, my dad was a World War II veteran. Uh, they they were from Red Hook. Red Hook was a really working class neighborhood. 
hit hard by the depression. Then it kind of turned in the sixties. It was, uh, uh, people moved out of, uh, Red Hook. Now, of course you can't afford to live in Red Hook. It's the uh, <laughs> most expensive place in Brooklyn or right. one of them. Uh, uh, but they came here, uh, uh, so many Catholics in civil service, right? And uh, uh, there were four big churches here in Bay Ridge, and uh, uh, it, it just kind of, people gravitated. There was a lot of rental uh, uh, apartments. Uh, the people that owned homes here in Bay Ridge tended to be uh, uh, upper income. So there was, a, I, I lived in a four-story walk-up on Fifth Avenue growing up, uh, you know, uh, it was, you know, certain, and I don't look back in those days and think, oh my God, how did we do that? I had a blast as a kid and uh, it was real. Uh, the whole building was full of families and uh, it just was a, a wonderful experience. Bay Ridge was fantastic and I, and I still enjoyed my, my time here. Bill Ryan says Bay Ridge used to be known as Yellow Hook. <laughs> I wonder That's why that is. I wonder why that is. Tell me. Uh, it was called Yellow Hook, I think, because of uh, some kind of uh, deposit that was in the soil. Uh, and there was a big yellow fever breakout in like the mid uh, 1800s. And it was uh, depressing everybody's real estate values. So the civic leaders of the neighborhood got together and changed the name to Bay Ridge. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I, I didn't know that little. You see a little uh, history tonight. You learn something new every day. And, you know, it is great because at that age, you're so curious. And what better place to be curious in than New York City? You get to experience so much. I mean, even now we have phones and obviously the pandemic has restricted a lot of kids from getting to experience things. But their upbringing, even now in, in the era of technology, provides them such a leg up. Because as you were saying earlier at the top, when you step out your front door, everything is right there. Yeah, it, I mean, uh, I remember as a kid, you know, we always called it going into the city, right? Going to Manhattan was going into the city. And, uh, uh, you know, I was like, you know, be able to go to a hockey game, a basketball game. I remember as a kid, you could never do this now, right? Because of barcoding and right. uh, all kinds of things. But there used to be a thing with going to a Ranger game. And, and the word would get around somehow that if you went to like Tower D to the last ticket taker on the left, all you had to have was a stub from a previous game. And you just kind of like palmed it. And you gave that guy five bucks and he let you in. And then, you know, you didn't have a seat, but you just went up to the blue seats and, you know, watched the game and you take the subway home and uh, you would just think that that was like a great, a great way to spend the day. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it was obviously, you know, we shouldn't be doing that, but you know, we, we did do that. And it was a blast. <laughs> we'll say allegedly it took place. Allegedly yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll blanket it with that. So, you know, you get on the job in 1985, and this is a time in which, you know, the academy is not a given in the sense that you don't have to go to the NYPD. You can go to transit. You can go to housing. A lot of guys and gals didn't want that, but some of them ended up there, and they made the most of it. But here you are coming in, as I've covered before, during a time in which there's so much to do, not for the best of reasons because crime's out of control, but you're going to learn very quickly. Uh, so when you got on in 85, we'll, we'll say in the academy first, six months there, obviously it pales in comparison to the real thing once you're out there. But what would you say was the best lesson you learned while there? Oh, wow. Uh, I guess uh, I'm going to say uh, probably two things. Uh, one was that you should treat everybody, uh, you know, with some level, level of, of decency, even even a guy you would brawl with, uh, and you know, you would you would you know hit people hard if you had to fight with someone, right? Uh, once the, you were back in the, the cell, like uh, back then, every, well, all the all the bad guys smoked. I always bought a pack of cigarettes for my bad guys as I was taking them down to central booking because a they wanted to smoke and b cigarettes were currency inside jail, so you're kind of you know helping a guy out, right. and uh. There was no reason for me not to do that. I was going to make 10, 12, 15 hours overtime on this guy. I might as well, you know, uh, you know, you know, tighten him up with a pack of cigarettes. Uh, it didn't hurt. Uh, that, I guess, some of the tactical lessons that they, they, they taught us, they did, you know, they did drive home the point that, you know, uh, people get killed in this line of work. And uh, you should be cognizant of that when you go out there. Uh, uh you know, you know, just if you're going to be doing something risky, know in the back of your head that you might have to pay a big, big price to do that. Uh, obviously, not everybody can do that. A lot of people kind of find their way on a job and then find places where they don't have to do that. Maybe they, they didn't realize it in the academy. And when they hit the street, they realize it. And that's OK. Not everybody, 
not everybody is made for the street. Uh, and some people find their way into spots and really do great at it. And there, and uh, God bless them. But uh, I just love being being out. Frankly. And the thing, the thing about it when you came on is that that was such a violent decade to be a cop because co it's not. I mean, now it's it's always a watershed moment and earth shattering news, if you will, when cops get hurt and cops get killed, like you saw in January with Rivera and Mora. But it was happening with such a disturbing frequency back then. And I think that's because there was more police departments back then with transit and housing. But still, same same mission, same uniform, you know, same oath. And it felt like if you go back to the archives, especially with the Officer Down Memorial page, there was a cop getting killed every other day, every other week in the city. Uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned, I, I, I look at ODMP and this day in history uh, all the time. Uh, the I think that the watershed moment in the first few years of my career was when Eddie Byrne was killed in yes. Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, it's one thing that when cops die in some kind of combat with uh, a perp, or, you know, responding to a scene and there's some kind of car accident. But it's another just to be sitting in your car and be executed. And uh, uh, that really uh, was uh, quite a quite a wake up call. I think that just for uh, me, I think for every member of the NYPD and, and certainly for the city at large, uh, they really I think that was the moment when the city decided that, you know, enough is enough. Right, because it was such a jolt in that it was police duty. He was protecting the home of a witness in a case, in a court case. But it's as you said, it was, and I think it was the same thing when Lou and Ramos were killed. They were on a, they were on a fixer. They weren't doing yes. anything, engaging yes. in, a, in a, an adversarial. They weren't in an adversarial position against no. a criminal trying to combat them. They were just sitting there. And they were yep, they were assigned to sit and sit in front of a housing project and really not move. Exactly. Quite frankly, yeah. So those those moments you're right about that are always the whoa moments. Although each of them obviously are very sad in in the fact that good people are lost, as we'll discuss tonight with a few friends of yours, um, in different and different scenarios. Jerry Kane, of course, is our guest tonight here on the Mike Today podcast. This is episode 161. A shout out to our friends in the live chat, and as always, if you have a question for Jerry, make sure to fire away in the live chat, and I'll I'll make sure that I uh, show it to him and he can answer it. I mentioned Billy Ryan earlier. He's here, of course, always a very big supporter of the show. Mike Kane, retired FDNY fire marshal. He was featured for volume 12 of the Best of the Bravest on this show. Good to see you, Mike. Adam Waxman's here. And he says, uh, you have the greatest guest ever. I love this guy. And Brian Keller, too. I know you from, uh, I know him, I should say, from the Getting Salty experience. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks for supporting the show. So that first command, that is, in, in a sense, a cop's best command. Not to say that his other or her other assignments throughout the course of their career won't be great, but you learn so much. And in a sense, even in a dangerous job like that, there is still such an innocence when you're first coming on because there's a lot of stuff about the job, maybe the politics of it, for example, that you don't know yet. And not only do you not know yet, you don't care about it. So for you, because you're just so eager to do the job, for you, what was that first command and, and what were the best memories that you have of that command? So uh, out of the academy, uh, I got lucky enough to get assigned to NSU-3. And if you were a cop from that generation, you knew that NSU-3 was the like the best place to go. It was the Midtown uh, rookie squad. And the people that went there all had hooks. And my dad was a retired subway conductor. And or actually, he was a subway conductor when I came on a job. He didn't have that kind of juice. And... Uh, there was a guy on my block. He used to go to work in uniform. I didn't really know him, but I knew he was a cop. I see him leave his house in uniform, get in his car. He worked in Brooklyn South Task Force. And he says to me one day, he goes, hey, uh, I see you in the academy. Because he would see me in my, we used to call it the Catholic school uniform. It was, a, it was like a powder blue shirt. And you carried this big giant bag with all your books and stuff in it. And uh, he goes, where do you want to go? I said, I don't know. Everybody says you got to go to NSU3. <laughs> and he goes, oh. Uh, give me your tax number. That's your ID number for the job. He goes, I'll get you there. And I'm like, how are you going to get me there? He goes, my brother is the CEO. And his brother was the CEO. I kid you not. So on the day when the orders come out in my company, uh, 8575 was my company. Uh, I think uh, the guys that went there, one guy's brother was shot in the line of duty. So he was going there. And the other guys all had dads who were bosses on a job. And me. And it was like, it's like I got there. It was like... Uh, it was dumb luck, really. It was just like a fluke. And once I got there, I kind of it was easy to stay. After your six months in NSU, uh, it's easy to kind of stay in the the zone you're in. I ended up staying in Midtown South, which is where NSU three was based out of. I didn't have to get a new locker. Uh, you know, once I got my orders to go to precinct, I just stayed exactly where I was. I just had to get new collar brass for my uniform. So 
in Midtown South, I started off uh, uh, in squad two, which was a great squad. We had this guy, Jimmy Takis was our sergeant. Uh, I ended up with this uh, great guy, uh, my buddy Ray Smith. I know you do a lot of E-Men stories. Ray retired out of truck two after like 33 years of a job recently. Uh, lives in Connecticut now with a wife and two daughters. Great, great guy. Yeah, to get him on the show. Yeah, he's uh, his, his dad was an E man for years in Staten Island, and uh, uh, me and Ray loved it. We worked around the clock, and uh, uh, then I ended up going to late tours probably around 1988, where I hooked up with a guy I'd be partners with for about eight plus years. This guy, Mike Sasek, uh, he, he was like you know, uh, the brother I never had. I have one sibling, it's a, a, my sister. And he was like the brother I never had. He, you know, uh, when you're with someone for so long, 40 hours plus a week, you know, uh, it's like actually you spend more time with them than you do your spouse. And uh, and uh, actually, I'll be quite frank, sometimes just like a marriage, you, you, you're, you're grumpy with each other. Like you just sit in the car, you don't even talk to each other, except about like the job, you know, because uh, you'd be mad at about some bull crap, right? Just like in a marriage. Right. So, uh, 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 in Midtown South, I had, I mean, it was fantastic. I was on midnight, midnight to eight shift back then in the eighties, there was so much crime. Uh, you just, it, it, you actually had to work not to make an arrest. Seriously. Uh, we did not make misdemeanor arrests, uh, uh, right or wrong. I will tell you that when you caught someone who just had a few, like, just like, uh, a few vials of crack, you would just throw the crack down a sewer and tell the guy, stay off the block. You didn't, you didn't take yourself out of service for a misdemeanor. That's leaving a car that could that should be out patrolling is going to be tied up with an arrest. And you couldn't do that to your squad mates or or anybody. Uh, you know, it just didn't seem morally right, to tell you the truth. Now, of course, with body-worn cameras and everybody has cell phones, that level of discretion for officers is gone. Gone. And that's, officers technically didn't have misdemeanor discretion, but they used it back then. And but now because of the technology that exists, uh, that kind of uh, that kind of discretion of making a spot judgment to not, not arrest someone and just you know dispose of the evidence uh, through the sewer system, that does that. There's no way any of that can happen these days. Uh, was making a lot of arrests, making a lot of overtime. Uh, I know you've had him on a show. That's how I met my friend uh, John Miller. Uh, pulled him over one night because he was driving like a madman, and. Uh, uh probably do a crime scene uh probably uh or a bar one or the other <laughs> and uh and then he uh i see him two days later in uh the elevator at the courthouse which is like a really weird coincidence and he remembered me like my you know he remembered my name obviously i knew who he was he was uh chasing john Gotti around all the time back in those days but uh uh he kind of remembered me he had reported on a homicide collar i made i had locked up a guy from uh uh, who was killed, a, a big-time Gambino was killed and uh, just locked locked up the shooter by just, you know, uh, wrong place at the wrong time. I guess it was the right place at the right time, but... Happenstance? At the moment, it seemed like the wrong... You know, like, holy crap, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, so John... Uh, uh, and and kind of after that, we would run into each other, and John and I became uh, pretty good friends. So uh, uh, uh was having a blast in Midtown South. Uh Giuliani gets elected mayor, 93. Uh, Bill Bratton comes in as police commissioner. John right. becomes deputy commissioner of public information, first time. And then uh, uh, Giuliani wants the cops to be proactive. And there was no way I was ever going to get into anti-crime. I had uh, too many CCRB complaints. Uh, I wrecked too many cars. I was known for wrecking cars. I was uh, not as good a driver as I thought I was, I guess. Uh, and... Uh, the lieutenant, I won't name him, the lieutenant actually said, Jerry Kane will be an anti-crime over my dead body. Well, like, then the election happened, and then Giuliani got inaugur inaugurated, and they needed hunters, and they put me and my partner into anti-crime, which was, you know, obviously, if when you're an active cop, that's exactly where you want to be, because it, it gives you an advantage over the bad guy, right? You, right. you know, they do see you. I mean, they're not idiots, but it, it closes the gap from maybe 10 seconds to four seconds, and you know, that those six seconds are sometimes very important. So uh, I love that. Uh, was making 
you know, co- it was, you know, it was sometimes really, really a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of fun to see a per, uh, perpetrator uh, stalking someone or stalking a location to commit a crime and they have no idea you're on them. And then they do it, you jump them. And I, you know, just like, a, you know, they try to explain like, oh, you got it all wrong. I just accidentally am here. And they don't realize that you were on it for a half hour or an hour exactly. or two hours, whatever, you know, whatever it took. Right. Uh, that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun in uh, Midtown South. Uh, I, I have to say though, uh, before I went to crime, probably the roughest thing, uh, there were a couple rough things. Uh, you know, I got, uh, I got in trouble in Midtown South. I got jammed up in the Tomka Square Park riot. Uh, uh, Totally, by the way, did not do it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, the, this guy said I pushed him. That's that's what the charge was, that I, I put my hand on his chest to shove Use him. Use of force or something like that. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I got charged by the department in the trial room with wrongfully pushing a person at a riot. And I got, yeah. got suspended for 10 days. But uh, uh, they, they, they gave me Christmas off, though. They gave me the 20th and 30th. No, I, <laughs> that worked I, out. I, right, so I didn't go. have Christmas and I didn't have the New Year's Eve details, so it was pretty good. There you go. Uh, uh, in 1989, uh, uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, police officer named uh, Anthony Dwyer, who is uh, uh, was just a he was a funny guy, uh, uh, sarcastic, very enthusiastic, uh, big guy, big strong guy. So like a lot of guys when they come on a job with the rookies, they'll be a little tentative. Uh, he knew he was as strong as anybody who could bust his chops. So like, like he he was respectful as a rookie, but he wasn't going to take any crap from anybody because he was as strong as anybody in the precinct. I've seen pictures of him. You're not kidding. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 He was, he was, he was, uh, uh, you know, he was the guy you wanted to show up at your 85 if you were having right. a fight with someone. So, uh, 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 Tony, uh, was on a foot post with Tom Dempsey. Great guy. Tom's a wonderful guy. Uh, uh, and uh, they had an 80 case in some one of these you, you BS hotels, uh, like these SRO hotels. Right. Can't remember which one it was. Uh, and uh, uh, Tony went up with EMS to uh, get the information from the victim, like, you know, they're either overdosing or sick or they injured themselves, whatever the problem is. It wasn't a crime. Uh, but uh, NYPD always documents, uh, at least then they did, uh, if they get notified of uh, one of these cases, it's called an aided case. So uh, uh, they're in the, uh, they're in the, uh, 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 you know, Tommy's upstairs with EMS and Tony's downstairs and, and Tom Flanagan comes by. Tom Flanagan's the sergeant uh, on patrol and he's got Kevin LeBrack as his driver. And they're given a, uh, uh, a, uh, a scratch, which is uh cop carries like a log with them uh, and the log, uh, you know, tells everything he's doing, and a sergeant has to sign your book at least once a day to say he's seen you on patrol, he's talked to you about what you're doing, just a, an accountability thing. Okay. And while they're there, uh, 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 a worker from the McDonald's, this is about three o'clock in the morning at 40th Street and 7th Avenue, comes running up to them. Uh, immigrant from West Africa, uh, named Adu. Uh, I can't remember his last name. What a what a great guy! What a great guy and solid witness. I... Jerry cut out a little bit there. Wait for Jerry to come back. Hold on one second while Jerry uh, maneuvers there. Okay, he's back. Lost you for a second. Okay. Back. Yeah, and I'm on the good Wi-Fi here too. <laughs> <laughs> Could be me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, so. Uh, they put it over the air to, to go at a live robbery uh, for anybody who's out there watching, who's not a cop, uh, you know, nine people will call 911 and say there's a robbery. And that comes over from the dispatcher. That's a hundred percent different than when a cop gets on the air with his own voice, reporting his own information that there's a robbery in progress and that they have guns. That's, that's what uh, Kevin LeBrecht said. So uh, me and Mike with a second car there, uh, I'll never forget this. Uh, these these perps, these uh, these guys, they were doing burglaries of fast food locations, and they were Coney Island guys, and they would take the safe out of the place, and they would take it to Coney Island, go under the boardwalk with it. Uh, you know, it's the middle of the night. They use sixteen pound sledgehammers to go to town on a thing until they busted up busted it open, and they take the cash out. Right. Right. That was their, that was their shtick. 
So they they go into this McDonald's and there were workers in there because they were retiling the dining room or something like that. There was something maintenance wise going on. Maybe they were putting new kitchen equipment in, but they were all in there. Oh, these these you know minimum wage McDonald's workers, and there was this skinny black girl, probably about nineteen years old. She was standing in the middle of the dining room. You would have thought like she was like stuck to the floor. She just had her hands over her face. You could tell she was terrified. I go in there and uh, I see Sergeant Flanagan and he says, Tony's on a roof. I'm going to check on him. So he goes up. There's like a ladder in the back of the kitchen like uh, that. You go straight up like one of those ladders is mounted to a wall. Okay. And uh, there was a there was a, sta- a, a stairway to the basement in the front of the dining room, and there was a stairway to the basement in the kitchen. I cover that that stairway, and I hear everybody yelling. They got they got a they got a bad guy. He's down there with a, a three eighty or twenty five or something. And okay, all good. And uh, uh, the other two perps had gone. And Flanagan comes. Sergeant Flanagan comes down and is like, "You seen Tony?" I said, no. So he goes back up and I go back up with him and we're on a roof and we're like, and he's like, the perp came up here and Tony came up here and neither one of them are there. And what had happened with the perp is, you know, he knew we were coming and uh, he found some cables and actually climbed up using cables and then kind of got over, swung himself over to a, another rooftop that was like a, uh, a floor above us. And, uh, all of a sudden, we look over the back of the roof, and Tony was down in the shaft. Uh, it wasn't really a shaft; it was like a just a space behind four buildings. Uh, but it was very air shaft like. It was about maybe four feet by uh, deep by like twenty feet wide. So he was down about three stories, <coughs> and uh, man, it was uh, uh, the sergeant starts calling the ten thirteen, but I can hear over my radio that's static because Tony was laying on his radio and he was knocking out the whole radio division. So, uh, cause he was key, key to his mic. So I switched to the next division down. And, uh, for those cops from that division, that cop, that division back then was the uh, sixth, uh, the 10th and the 13th precincts, man, they responded. Like they were not used to hearing my voice on the radio. Uh, uh, now I'm, I'm asking everybody to come up into Midtown South. Uh, they came, uh, they did a great job. Uh, emergency service came. Uh, actually, just before we found Tony, I had called for emergency service because, uh, you know, a McDonald's is all uh, ceramic tile. You do not want to be in a shootout in a place like that because every bullet's going to have like two or three chances to kill you. Right. And uh, I wanted them. To, so uh, two guys from uh, uh, emergency service, Jimmy Anderson and Billy Lutz. I know you've had uh, Johnny Lampkin on. Uh, they're good friends of John. Uh, uh, they're in front of the, I didn't realize that they're in front. They're tacking up. They're putting on a heavy vest. They're grabbing the heavy weapons, which back in, back in those days has involved a, a 12 gauge Ithaca shotgun. Yeah. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, someone's yelling, they need ropes. It's a rope rescue, blah, blah, blah. So I had called for everybody. I had asked for ESU, EMS, you know, when, when I'm, I'm looking down there and seeing them. And I asked for FDNY rescue. Uh, and frankly, I would have called the Department of Sanitation if they had a rescue team that could help. I wanted my friend saved. Okay. ESU and FDNY were, were battling back in those days. It was a big yeah. rivalry. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you that the there was no rivalry on its job. They, they, they worked hand in hand. Two firemen, uh, uh, two rescue workers went down into the hole. Uh, uh, an E-man and a fireman. And two, and the other, and a, the other two, uh, other firemen and, and E-men worked from uh, above and other firemen and E-men worked from the adjoining, the basement of the adjoining building, ultimately using sledgehammers, busting a hole through the wall to get Tony out. Uh, pretty, I was, uh, God, I was just 30 years old and uh, I had uh, a young son home and I uh, this is how long, long ago it is. That son just became a father uh, last summer. And uh, the uh, uh, I'm in the ambulance, and this is this is kind of like a screw. My partner, Mike, I told you my partner, Mike Sasek. Yeah. Mike was uh, an EMT on Long Island. And uh, Mike used to have me do things to help him because there was so much trauma back in those days. But I didn't. I, I wasn't trained. 
And somehow or another, we screwed it up and because they we, we ended, loaded them in the bus and Mike ended up in the front cab with one of the uh, EMS guys. And I ended up in the back with the paramedics. So they're pushing meds. They're doing rescue breathing for them. I was doing the chest compressions and they were doing uh, – back then they used to do these things called uh, – I believe the acronym is MAS, like uh, something, something trauma – they were like inflatable pants that you put on someone. Uh, I think the theory was you pushed all the blood up into the core of the body where the organs are. Mm-hmm. I do not believe that trauma uh, medics use those things anymore, but it was it was applied. Uh, we bring Tony uh, into uh, Bellevue, and uh, like they, you know, even though it's now three thirty in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, they are manned and ready. Uh, you know, Matt, uh, Bellevue's a trauma one, uh, a level one trauma center. They had surgeons, they had nurses, they had technicians. The paramedics, of course, are in up to their elbows. They all know each other. And uh, there was a valiant, valiant effort made to save Tony, and it didn't didn't work. The uh, I did remember that Tony was a very good Catholic while we're there, much better than me. Uh, he, was a much, he was a better man than me, actually. And uh, uh, I, I, did a, I didn't know what to do, so I did a... Uh, uh, last rites. I did a Hail Mary and an Our Father with my hand on him. And uh, I figured he probably won't. He probably would have wanted that. It just goes to show you, right? Look at this. This is 30, <laughs> 33 years ago. It'll be 33 years ago this year, later this year. And it's still, uh, it still hurts. Tony was 23 years old. 23. He'd be 56 now. He'd be like a retired guy that you get on your show. To talk about like he probably would have ended up being an e-man he was a, a volunteer firefighter he was a medic he would have been a natural to go into emergency and uh 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 unfortunately uh he he had two years of a job and he was 23 years old and uh you know he didn't he didn't make it uh his brother came on a job his brother andy came on a job wore tony's shield that's uh 10236 wore that shield which i think is a pretty you know, gutsy thing to do. Right. And uh, uh, Andy ended up, I can't remember if he blowed his knee or his shoulder or something. He got three quarters for uh, uh, something or other. Uh, he's doing well. Uh, Tony's parents are still alive. Greatest people in the world. If you ever get a chance to meet them, you're a lucky man. They are f- wonderful. Uh, uh, Tony's other brother, uh, Larry, and his sister Maureen, uh, they, they carry on his legacy. Uh, one of the things that we have to do, though, in New York State, which is a very liberal state, is every two years we have to go to the parole board. We have to write statements. We have to get people to send letters in. Uh, and every two years we kind of go through this and, like, you know, hope to God that he's not going to get out. Uh, uh, not saying his name, uh, but, you know, yeah. I, it, it, it's something I think about. It, it's in the back of my mind. And that could cause me to leave the city, to be quite frank, because he would be here in the city uh, if he was out. And I don't know if I want to be an old man hobbling around in a town that would let this guy breathe free air. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but he's been in jail since that day. A big shout out to Brooklyn South Homicide, Manhattan South Homicide, and uh, the Midtown South Detective Squad, who did a wonderful, amazing, amazing job. Uh, uh, picking up all the perps. Uh, uh, P. Castellaro was the ADA, great ADA. Uh, did a great job on the case, and because it, it was not a slam dunk, uh, right. there was no eyewitnesses to it. Tony made a statement to me that he was pushed, and he made a, pay, a statement to my partner Mike Sask that he was pushed. But we're in there, you know. Other than that, uh, you know, and and uh, the perp had made some uh, uh, statements uh, that put himself at the scene in, in like a accidental struggle with Tony, right? You know, every, perps always try to mitigate uh, their involvement. Their crimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, that was a rough thing to go through as a young cop. I, I had four years on a job. Uh, Tommy Flanagan, the sergeant, was twenty five years old, and he had he had four years on a job. Back then, you could get promoted to sergeant after three years, and he like eighth. There was a sergeant's test right after we came on. He was same class as me, and he was a smart guy, and he and he passed, it, and he got promoted. And you know, to be twenty five years old and four years on, yeah, four years on a job, and one of your cops dies, uh, that's 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 rough. Uh, 
Tommy, Tommy is doing great. He lives up in uh, Skinny Addles, New York, which is one of the most beautiful places in New York State. God bless him. And uh, uh, but uh, I always feel for, for for Tom, especially after I put the stripes on myself. I, thank right. God I never had to go through something like that. But I was I had ten years on a job when I made sergeant, uh, not three. And uh, uh, and he was a brand new, you know, he was a brand new sergeant. Uh, I mean it. You can still see the threads, like where he sewed on his stripes, and uh, uh, I always feel bad for him with that. Obviously, not as bad as I feel for the Dwyers, and, uh, but uh, you know, of all of, of all the cops that were there, I think that that that, that had to be really rough on him. Uh, he's never said that to me. He's a pretty pretty strong guy, but I, I feel for him. So you think you think about it every day, and never leaves you. And the thing that I remember is Lieutenant Paul Schmidt, who was with FDNY Rescue One that night. They came down, as you said, you called them in, rescue one and truck one for me as you came down. And he said he was talking to Tony and he was because Tony did, you know, this is what makes it worse. Tony didn't die right away. It'd be one thing if he went down and he didn't have to suffer, at least he suffered. Yeah. And it said, Paul was talking to him. He's like, are you all right? Basic questions. Are you all right? Stay with me. Tell me about yourself. Tony was talking to him for almost an hour while they worked yeah. to get him out. Yeah. And he thought that Tony would make it because at least he was conscious. He was alert. But his injuries, even for a big, strong guy like that, you fall down three stories into right. a shaft like that, it's going to be very difficult not to succumb to them. And I, what's even weirder and sadder is that one of the ADAs, if you remember, her husband was Charlie Davis, who got shot and killed in the line of duty in 96, the Warrens cop, who was working the off-duty job. Seven years later, she here she is, she gets justice for a fallen cop, and her oh husband gets God. killed. Man. Seven years later, she goes Jeez. through the same exact thing, different scenario. Now she's she's the one that needs justice. Jeez. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's well, a, a cruel way. It was kind of circular. I didn't think that Tony was going to die either. And yeah. uh, when I went over to the next building and into the basement, because they said they're going to bring him out. And actually the sergeant just said, we're going to carry him up to the ambulance. Because we were like, we went into this job with him. We're going to bring him up to the, the bus. Right. And they brought him through this hole that they had made. And they put him on this big table. And a firefighter jumps up. He didn't have his full turnout gear on. He just had his pants on and... Uh, like the the T-shirt that they always wear, right? Keep back two hundred feet, and he had his helmet on. He threw his helmet off, and he started giving mouth to mouth to Tony. And I'm like looking, like, why is he doing that? I swear to God, I could not even process like what was happening. And uh, 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 so you know, it uh, it was listen. Everybody made a uh, did their best. Probably hundreds of people did their best uh, to try and uh, to try and save him. He just couldn't be saved so we did the next best thing the detectives and that's said that's when i decided at some point in my career i wanted to work upstairs on the second floor because i uh you know i was shattered and within 24 hours those guys in the suits upstairs to smoke cigars <laughs> they they had rolled up everybody everybody that was involved was wearing handcuffs and was in a cell and uh uh, that was something that meant a lot to me and I really appreciated it. So, uh, so that was, uh, uh, something I, you know, I wouldn't want anybody to have to go, go through, but, uh, uh, it's, it, it does, you can die on this job. You can. And, uh, and he was doing the absolute best thing. There were people being terrified by bad guys with guns and they went there to stop that. That is that's heroism defined. Personified. Yeah. And you know what? It's, it's a good thing that we're talking about it. And I've said this before, and I know it sounds redundant to some in the audience, but respectfully, I do not care. I will say it again. If you want the definition of heroism and you happen to be in the city of New York, I want you to stop in Brooklyn, where the FDNY headquarters is, and I want you to read the names on that memorial wall. And then when you're done there, take a trip down to Manhattan and one police plaza and go read the names on that memorial wall. And you will then understand what heroism is. And they, and each and every name on that memorial wall from the beginning of the department in the 1700s to now personifies exactly what we're talking about. And Mr. Dwyer's name is, is up there. Another young cop that same year, Robert Machati, was also killed 25 years old. I yeah. believe he was when he was shot and killed in a domestic. Jeff mm -hmm. Herman, another young guy, was also killed, I believe, that same year. Same mm -hmm. scenario, shot and killed on a domestic. It's, it doesn't matter how old you are. You could have three minutes on the job you could have three months three decades and yeah. if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time unfortunately or you know that that's what can happen and yeah you know, yeah but it's uh, uh you know whatever whatever yeah. uh i you know i just uh uh 
it's it's just nothing that uh, uh, I I I would. I obviously you appreciate cops, and obviously I appreciate cops, and probably people are watching this podcast too. But I, I wish people would would really appreciate cops more. Not, not, I'm not even a cop anymore. It's been a long time since I retired. Uh, but man, you know they, they when you see them and you hear people gripe. Oh, look at them! They're just in the car on their phone. Uh, they just look. They just look like they're doing nothing. They're sitting there having coffee. Right? They're doing all those things. 100 percent correct. But when a call comes over the radio, they're gonna go. They're gonna go. And who knows what's going to happen to them when they get there? Who else does that for you? And it's the same for the firemen. You know, they are yeah, people see them in the supermarket, and they're like, oh yeah, all they do is come to the supermarket, buy food, and go back and forth. You know mm-hmm. what? Yeah. They also have to turn off the gas. And I don't know how by the way, that's a trick. How do they like reignite the get the food going again after they turn off the <laughs> but uh they just freaking go, they go and uh uh, you know, uh, they don't know if it's going to be just a like a, a, a small kitchen fire or if it's going to be a fully involved fire. Uh, that poor firefighter died uh, just a, a month and a half ago, in out in, or a month ago in a far in Rockways. Yep. You know that was a that was a pretty heavily involved house fire, right? And okay. uh, it's it stressed his body, and you know he probably had a heart attack, and he had a heart attack. Yeah. You know, and and. You know, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a retired firefighter. He goes, yeah. He goes, you know, your core temperature gets superheated. And he goes, it's not good for you. <laughs> and like, no kidding. We're probably yeah. not supposed to be heated up like that. So uh, it was, uh, you know, actually, I'm going to say, I'll say this. And I know you got firefighters who are, who are fans and, and guests. People like firemen because firemen fight a thing. No one has ever walked up to a fireman and said, Hey, dude, why do you put water on that fire? I grew up with that fire. The fire was a good guy. But no matter who you arrest, no matter who you arrest, no matter how horrible a person they are, somebody loves them. Somebody yes. loves them. Yes. And they and, and because of that, they hate you. That's it. Case closed. So right. uh, you know, they fight a thing. We fight people. Yeah, I, I I think of Mike O'Keefe. You know Mike O'Keefe. We both oh, do it. Yes, yes. And and I have to get Mike on the show. Why I haven't yet, I don't know. It's shame on me. And it's like the guy he took out, Kiko Garcia, was trying to kill him. It was and was a really bad guy, you know, a menace to that neighborhood. And yet, you know, nods in his song halftime, he puts him in there. He's like, and that foul cop who shot car. I'm like, Mr. Mr. Nas, are you aware of the kind of guy, the kind of character that, uh, that Mr. Garcia possessed? But no, you know, right. getting back into your career now, Jerry Kane's our guest tonight here in the Mike DeVay podcast. It's been a great conversation with him. When you made Sergeant, you mentioned that earlier, getting those stripes on your uniform. One of the things you had was supervising transit detectives. Now, what's fascinating about that is that now, the transit detail, I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy, especially these days, but cops are more used to it because it's been so long since the merger. Many of the old timers that were there when the merger happened, you know, the, if they're still there, they're about to retire if they're not retired already. 96, the merger just happened. It's kind of like a merging of rosters, if you will. You absorb their talent and they have a certain way of doing things. And their gripe is, well, these cops only come in. When somebody got hit by the train, there's an investigation to do it. Maybe they assist us. They don't know the subway. They never come downstairs. And here you are coming downstairs. How hard was that for you? Well, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I get there, and uh, right away, there's uh, they, they're looking at me side-eyed because uh, I'm a street cop, right? Uh, they, uh, you, know, you get that tax ID number I told you, right? So they took the, all the transit cops, and they gave them new tax ID numbers because now they're members of the NYPD. And all their numbers started with nine. And mine started with an eight. So that's how they were referred to me to as an eight. They'd be like, oh, yeah. Like, I'd hear them say to like another transit cop. Oh, yeah, he's an eight. Yeah, right. Like, so that was like how they knew I was a street cop. And uh, my first day at the squad, I worked for this guy, uh, George Menick. And I'll keep it clean. I know you, you like a nice, clean show. I know, George. George was, George was hysterical. Yeah. And a uh, good friend of Johnny Lampkin, by the way. And, and George uh, was an E-man, too. Yeah, and yes, he was. And uh, George says to me, he goes, Kane, <laughs> he says, because he was home. It's a Sunday. I'm doing a Sunday 4 to 12. He goes, don't call me uh, unless you F up or there's a murder. I'm like, okay, no problem. So I tell the guys that, uh, you know, I don't know how to supervise investigations. Even though I've been experienced, I've been involved in like some, like a cop killing is like the heaviest case you could be involved in. I mean, oh, I've yeah. been involved in things. Uh, 
I, I've been involved in a mafia case and involved the feds and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, so the, uh, uh, I'm like, I tell the guys, I go, look, there's like, I, I'll go, if anybody needs overtime, I'll sign your overtime form. I know how to sign an overtime form. And if anybody needs some cop time off, right? A lot of times guys will, will have the plenty of time with the books. They'll, they'll decide they're going to take the half the shift off, go home, or that maybe, you know, they'll, they'll go drinking. Who knows what they're going to do, right? I'll say, if anybody needs to take time off, let me know. I'll sign you 28. I'm not afraid to exercise my authority as a sergeant to either give you overtime or give you time off. And I'm sitting here with the Sunday Times, a big Starbucks coffee. And the patrol sergeant from District 1 comes in. I think this job was actually in District 2, but uh, he comes running and he goes, uh, there's a murder, 23rd Street and Broadway. And I'm like, what? He goes, a woman was pushed in front of a train. So I go to this guy, Ray Paulino, who was uh, a, 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 life, a transit lifer. And I go, how often does this happen? And he goes, this never happens. I know there's a bit of rash in them recently, but this was not something that, like, happens. It happened at least then. Uh, so we mount up, we go down there, and there was an inspector here from transit, full bird inspector. And I got, you know, got my suit on. I put my shield in my pocket. I got my notepad. I'm like, what? You know, what do they say? Uh, uh, fake it till you make it, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, okay, I'll just stand here with my shield in my pocket and a notepad in my hand, and I'll, you know, maybe I'll figure this out. And he's like, okay, the squad's here. And he says to me, you're in charge. And I'm like, what? But uh, in Midtown South, I had worked for uh, – well, first of all, I'll, I'll go back to the case real quick. Yeah. I got – I caught a real uh, lucky break. Uh, the perp was caught by the people that were on the platform waiting for the train. They just grabbed him. They did not beat the living daylights out of him, which is fantastic. And two patrol cops, uh, I think from the 13th precinct, showed up to the call, cuffed him up. He was off to the 13th. The uh, uh, the victim was a woman by the name of Kendra Webdale. She's very famous uh, because there's a law in New York State called Kendra's Law. Yes. And Kendra's Law uh, means that if someone has uh, been diagnosed with mental illness and it's severe mental illness and uh, they don't prove that they're taking their medications, a judge can order them confined to a mental hospital. Uh the uh, I God, I can't remember the name of the perp. I could picture him. I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, he he's out. He he recently was paroled. Uh, so uh, I had worked for a guy named Jimmy Robert. Uh, Jimmy passed a couple of years ago. He was a legendary lieutenant in the NYPD. Worked like forty years. Uh, uh, he was a second grade detective before he made sergeant. Uh, he chased the BLA, the KGB. Uh, he did things that like no one else did. And he was a, an eccentric guy. He was a character, but he, one of his things was controlling and organizing a crime scene properly. So I knew how to control and organize a crime scene properly because he, you know, rammed it home. So we got the perp. I know we got to get a notification on the victim. Two detectives are already going to take care of that. Uh, Scotty Dillon, who just passed, he was from Manhattan, South Homicide. Uh, he died, unfortunately, way too young. And uh, I forget who was with Scotty. Maybe Willie Hamilton, I forget. And uh, uh, I got my guys there. They're doing their thing. They know the transit stuff they got to do. They're talking to the motorman. They're talking to the conductor. They're getting the markers off the posts about where the body was hit and the car numbers and all this stuff, which I didn't know that you had to get all that stuff. And usually transit will give you a hard time about holding the trains for a crime scene because they want to keep the trains moving because there's thousands and thousands of people relying on the, the train service. They did not give me a hard time. It was it was done slowly and methodically uh, by crime scene and emergency service, because obviously it's not just documenting her uh, where she is, but then, of course, it's extricating her carefully and, and with dignity and with safety, of course, for the people that have to do it, right? Uh, so I was going to go in for a nice Sunday and read the Sunday Times. I came home. Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to detective work. So uh, uh, it was interesting. Uh, the, the transit cops, I'll tell you what I did find out about transit cops. There are a lot of good cops on the street because there's a lot of ways you can move around on the street and, you know, surveil people, uh, figure out what's going on. Surveilling people in the subway system 
when you're in one subway car with somebody is an art. And there are guys that, and gals that do it in plain clothes. And there are guys and gals that do it in uniform and do it really well, really well. And uh, the transit had those. So the transit cops, and I know you've heard this line, Mike. They called it the hostile takeover, right? Yep. Thousands and they, thing. they know the date, for crying out loud. If you're, like, looking on Facebook, when the date rolls around, there's, like, all kinds of memes about it, right? <laughs> it's like they – they and they, you know, there was a whole superiority thing for NYPD over transit. I, I will tell you, like, you know, I worked in Midtown South, so we had the busiest subway stations in the city. We had Grand Central, we had four, two, and seven, four, two, and eight, three, four, and eight, three, four, and, and Broadway, Herald Square. We had them all. And uh, 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 then Bill Bratton, before he was police commissioner, he was transit chief. He gives them new uniforms, gives them Glocks, gives them these uh, uh, Caprice radio cars with Corvette engines. Gives them an ESU. Yeah. Oh, it was all right. They had their own ESU, Emergency Medical Rescue Unit. Right. Yeah. Those guys came for Tony. Yep. Transit EMRU came. So uh, the uh, within six months of Bratton taking over that job, they thought they were better than us. And maybe they were better than us. I don't know. But uh, they, but they was they was no more them feeling like inferior they actually felt superior to us so uh brat really turned that job around uh but then they then they were upset with him because he kind of engineered the uh the merger of housing and transit into the overarching city agency right uh uh i think i think transit's a unique enough policing environment same with housing okay. that maybe you do need your own departments. I know it's a bureau in the NYPD and they have their own de dedicated three-star chief. Uh, but uh, it's it's unique. It's unique. Uh, by investigating crimes down there for two years, they, they are unique. But uh, well, listen, it's not, it's not all sadness. I'll, I'll tell you a, a good funny story about uh, Go Transit Squad. Uh, we had this robbery pattern going uh, with us and the Queen's Transit Squad. This guy was uh, had a backpack, and he would walk up to you know he'd be in a subway car, and he would go into the, the backpack and take out a silver handgun and rob people. We had like maybe six or seven cases, maybe same for Queens, something like that. And Queens robbery, Queens transit robbery thinks they got him, and we bring out like two or three of our victims. I, I don't go. Somebody goes out there. Yeah, there's always got to be a sergeant to supervise the lineups. They had their own sergeant. I didn't go, and. It, it's not the guy. Nobody hit. Nobody hits on the perp in the lineups. One of our perp. One of our victims leaves the transit squad office and is getting on a subway to go home. And he's on one of these. You know, those Queens has those big stations, and like yep. it seems like the other side of the station is like you know, two hundred feet away. It's like a he mountain. On the other side of the platform, and the guy that robbed him is robbing someone else. He sees him. He calls up nine one one. Two uniform cops. I don't know if it's street cops or transit cops. Get there, grab the perp. I get the call on this. I'm like, this is um, this is like unbelievable. So we're trying to gather all our witnesses up again. Let's do some lineups again because we're we're pretty confident now. People are gonna ID this guy. And I get a call from District Four, Union Union Square, and they say, uh, "Yeah, a guy just walked in here. He says, you know, he never made a report. He goes last week, about eight days ago, he got robbed by a guy with a backpack and a silver gun." I'm like, what? I go, where is he? They go, he's sitting right in front of the desk. I go, keep him there. I said, two detectives, they grab him. They go from Union Square right out to Queens. They take a nose with him. They walk in and go, you're going to see six people. If you recognize anybody, let us know. He goes, number four or whatever the guy's <laughs> number was. And that guy, is a, in my entire career, is the only guy who had like the, the, the TV show experience. From the moment he told the cops to the moment – he he saw the perp through the glass and I did him less than sixty minutes. Who who gets that? Like no. And he's he's still telling that story. I guarantee you. If he's still around, <laughs> which I hope he is. He's probably still telling that story. So uh, uh, we, we listen. We had fun. We had a bunch of characters. Uh, right. We used to go to Two Toms, which is a an Italian restaurant in Brooklyn that is no longer. Uh, uh, that was like a real blue collar place, and uh, we'd go there every year for our Christmas party and. Uh, uh, just had some uh, good times. Uh, we did some serious cases. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of suicides, unfortunately, uh, especially in, in uh, 1999. 
because of uh, they, they, they theorize because of Y2K. Uh, normally, Manhattan would get about 30, 30 ish suicides a year. We had 62 that year. Okay. It, it was like every other day you would hear over the radio it was called BIE, which is breaks an emergency. As soon as you heard on the radio that a train was breaks an emergency, you would start getting yourself ready to go. Get a new notepad, you know, uh, uh, maybe go use the bathroom real quick because you, we're all going to mount up and go. And uh, and we're going to go. Uh, you know, that's that's going to be it. Uh, my, la my last day there, <laughs> my, my last day there, I know I'm going to work for Police Commissioner Carrick. And I told all my guys, I go, look, be back here around 3 o'clock. I'm going to go uh, over to Desmond's around the corner. Or, uh, you know, I'll have a drink or, or two or, or four. And it's like 3 o'clock, and there's no one in the squad. I'm like, where are these guys? And I now get a little angry. And then right over the radio, you, I hear a cop yelling, shots fired. Oh, this is, you know, I, 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 I call everybody's cell phone, let them all know what's going on. I go shooting down. There. It was like, I think it was 14th Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, uh, some, some, some drug, druggy guy pulled a knife on a uniform cop and a uniform cop shot him right in the, right, in, right where it counts. Not the, not the heart. <laughs> so, uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So Ooh. now. Uh, this is instead of me being in Desmond's and having a few cocktails and you know reminiscing my last two years in transit, I probably don't get out of there till about four o'clock in the morning. And uh, the next day, I was at the police commissioner's office. <laughs> well, that's quite the introduction to one police plaza. But to your point earlier about the merger, it's hilarious because our friend Scotty Wagner, if he's watching, I know he feels the same way because he was a housing guy. And, you know, he's like, yeah, I remember him telling me off the air, Mike, we finally got our own detective squads and our own ESU, and then they merged us. You know, he, he gets so mad because he calls it the little advice. I think it was like, we finally got all the upgrades. And right when we did, they merged us. You know, but it, but it worked out because, you know, and I had these conversations with my e-cops, you know, is that when you when they absorbed all the transit emergency rescue guys and the housing emergency rescue guys, all the cross training kicked in. The housing guys knew how to do elevator jobs. The transit guys knew how to do train jobs. So right. now we could all train each other and we're better equipped going right. forward to respond to these things. And I remember Medic, not on this show. He was on uh, Off the Cuff a while ago with Bill and Mark. And <laughs> he, he tells a story where I guess it was an Irish desk sergeant. I'll clean the language up a little bit. You know, since this is a G-rated show. It's, it's, it's tough with George. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was like, George, he, was a, he happened to be the desk sergeant that night, George was. And, it's like, and the Irish guy says to him, George, I don't understand how you can get a, 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 desk, a force complaint. You were the effing desk sergeant. For God's sakes, you jumped <laughs> over the desk and pummeled the man. So uh, Mr. Manning, I'm going to have to get him on the show soon. Uh, oh, God, he used, to, he used to threaten the detectives with violence all the time. He used to threaten me with violence all the time. It was hysterical, absolutely hysterical. And, so, uh, I, so my apologies, go ahead. No, it, 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 listen, George is a great guy, great cop. Uh, I'll say something nice about George, and I, I know we're going to talk about 9-11 a little bit. George yeah. after, George had retired just before 9-11 happened. Oh, really? And know. after 9-11, he went to truck one because he knew that there had to be all kinds of administrative stuff that had to be done. A, truck one lost a guy. B, the guy's going to be working 18, 20 hours a day nonstop. How do you keep the, the, the truck functioning? Because they need supply. You need like an admin, admin guy. And he also wanted to make sure that they were all documented for their exposure because he knew that this day would come where everybody's getting sick from ground zero. Right. And he he went and and, and uh, did that as like a volunteer. And he wore like a bathrobe in the office with like his lieutenant shield pinned to his bathrobe. And like, you know, captains and inspectors would walk in and be like, who is this guy? And they'd be like, oh, he's a retiree. He's helping us out. <laughs> they were like, all right, we're all good. Uh, uh, George, George is a, a great guy, uh, and he was a great cop. I, you know, I wish he had stayed on a job, frankly, because uh, he was one in a million, and uh, he knew what he was doing. He really didn't know what he was doing. And the guy that one truck lost, of course, you're talking about Brian McDonald, who was a, who was a junior E man. He hadn't been in ESU very long, and he did great work that day. I think he was last heard from on the 20th floor of Tower One. Uh, before he, he made the ultimate sacrifice as one of his last transmissions, if I have that correct. So, you know, I guess when you're going to work for Bernie Carrick, 
it was a bit of a change. I, I often make the joke that during the Giuliani years, the NYPD had as many commissioners as Spinal Tap had as drummers, because you went from Brat in the first two years, you know, him and Giuliani fought, the Time Magazine cover did Bill in, and then you had Howard Safer for four years. You stood, the, you know, who was there the longest of the time, him and Giuliani were relatively simpatico. They didn't disagree on much. And then you get Bernie for that last year. I mean, controversial guy now for reasons we don't have to get into. But, you know, I've always gotten the gist from people I've talked to about him. He was a pretty easy guy to deal with. What was it like working under him? Uh, he was a tough boss, actually. He So he had a yeah. lot of things and uh, that, that were particular to him. He wanted you to wear a white shirt, dark suit. He wanted your shoes to be shined. Like, seriously. I, I, I must have got four shoe, uh, shoe shines a week. I always made sure my car was washed. I always made sure my suit looked good. Uh, uh, he wanted you to be, you know, answer your phone when you when uh, the phone rang, right? Uh, I was a cop with it. The, the reason I knew Bernie is uh, we were cops together in Midtown South. He was an excellent street cop. Excellent. Great street Warren's cop. cop. And uh, so uh, he brought me in there uh, and he gave me, like, probably the best job you can have in the NYPD. I, my job was to respond to every major event. I was a sergeant. Uh, yeah, they gave me an unmarked car to take home. I was making overtime like there was no tomorrow. I was running around the city lights and sirens like there was no tomorrow. And when there was nothing going on, sometimes I did. Uh, I would go to like uh, he'd be like, "Hey, go go hang around for a couple of days in this precinct and just drive around, and get a feel for what's going on because their their crime is going through the roof." Right. Uh, I remember being out in a seven five on a late tour, and. I, I see these two guys sitting in a car. So I pull up to them. I'm like, hey, I'm Sergeant Kane from the uh, PC's office. I'll give you guys a scratch. And this one guy goes, Yo, get out of here. You're from the PC's office? I go, yeah, I'm from the, I'm from PC's office. And the one guy goes, not only have I never met the PC, I've never met anybody from the PC's office. <laughs> and uh, I would come in in the morning and tell Bernie, you know, like I saw the cops. They were running to the jobs. They were responding. It's not. It's not a lack of leadership or this or that. You know, it might be lack of resources. Maybe they don't have enough people in the precinct, right? right. Uh, you know, he was the the big guy. You know, he ran the job. Uh, you could. What was good is you could even as a sergeant, you could influence some things uh, way outside my pay grade. Uh, I was able to get the Forster and Laurie investigation uh, reopened. Uh, there was a Port Authority detective, a guy named Tom McHale, an amazing cop. Uh, he's locked up multiple Black Liberation Army members from multiple cop killings across the, the United States. He's a Port Authority cop. And he's locked up Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. I mean, not that many people have that on their resume. And so uh, Tommy had explained uh, explained to me there was a guy got locked up in a 6'9". For domestic, he had a gun. He was an old BLA guy. Tommy goes and debriefs him, and the guy, the guy is like running his mouth. And Tommy realizes the guy just put himself in the the uh, homicide of an Atlanta cop named Green. I can't remember Green's first name. Tommy spends like the next four months building a case against this guy. And when he builds the case against him, he realizes he's got this other guy named Ronald Vickers, who's a shooter of Force or Lori. He knows it. So, uh, uh. And so Tommy's got Tommy was the preeminent detective in America on a Black Liberation Army at that time. They were like now they were not active anymore at all, but there was a lot of crimes that they had never been arrested for, and all the players are still out there. And uh, uh, so I sold it to Bernie. I was like, Bernie, we could just have him send over his information. And that's kind of like what the FBI does. I know you know FBI guys. FBI guys do things called leads. They send a they send a net. A, New York sends a message to Philly, and some guy you don't know the guy who gets it if he's going to be you know into it or not. And I knew Mikhail was into it, and so uh, Bernie made a call to Port Authority, and I actually had made a, make a call to the FBI too because uh, Tommy was in the Newark FBI office as a JTTF guy, and we got him assigned to major case where he worked with Inspector George Duke, who was absolutely the best. And they opened, they reopened the case. Unfortunately, 9-11 interrupted that, right? Uh, they did ultimately satisfy that case. Robert Vickers was never arrested for <clears throat> Lori. First Morgenthau, then Vance, 
were, didn't have the stomach to bring it to the grand jury. And I understand the political ramifications of of that. Uh, but the Albany DA and the New York State Attorney General's office and the Albany cops uh, and the NYPD Intelligence Division uh, did a case on Vickers up in Albany. He was selling drugs and guns and bomb making instructions. And they 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 took this skinny girl out of uh, she was like a beanpole out of uh, the Albany Police Academy, taught her how to act like a junkie, and and she started buying drugs from him. They had informants buying drugs from him. They built a great case against him, and he he's got like thirty something years to life. So he's he's in, he's in his seventies. He's going to die in jail. Which is appropriate. He's not going to die in jail for force or worry. We we know he's he was part of force or worry, but uh, he's going to die in jail nonetheless. So great great work by all those people that were involved, and uh, uh, they all they all deserve a free drink if I'm around for sure. The uh, cop that you referenced, not to cut you off from Atlanta, is James Green. He was assassinated on a one man patrol November third, nineteen seventy one. Good job, Mike. Thank you. No so uh, uh, so Carrick, it was great. I I. Uh, I'm running around to all these incidents, and uh, he also had me handling visiting law enforcement dignitaries. So, uh, chief would come in from Baltimore or Chicago. I'd pick the guy up at the airport. I would bring him in to see the commissioner. Maybe I'd take the guy around. Sometimes I would assign, depending on the size of the city and the size of the agency, I would assign two detectives from Intel to, to, to take care of the guy. Carrick used to tell me, we don't want anything to happen to that guy in this city. Like, that would be embarrassing, right? right. Like, you know, so... We're going to get him in, and we're going to get him out with no problems. So uh, the Intel guys were great. They used, they knew how to handle VIPs, you know, those guys that are in executive protection wing at Intel. And uh, uh, I had been in that wing when I guarded Judge Snyder. I, I guarded Judge Leslie Snyder in there, uh, which was a great job. So, uh, so uh, it kind of – that gig kind of led me into my post-retirement career, but uh, – uh, kind of through, through like a 9-11 fluke. Uh, so I went to all the big jobs for Bernie, right? So I was at, you know, I'm, I was home. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Mike, and I'm sure you've heard this. The things that saved your life on 9-11, you can never do the math on it. The left, you made a left, you made a right, you paused, you didn't pause, you hesitated, you jogged a little, you walked a little, you stopped, you looked up, you looked, you know, who knows? You, you change any one of those things, you could be dead. I mean, that's how death was. Uh, there was a lot of death, and it was uh, chaotic and random. And all of our guys, I don't know all the firefighters that died, but all of our guys that died were all better cops than me. All of them. All of them. And how did they die and I did? Like, how did you, right? Are you going to tell me that uh, uh, oh, I, I was better that day? I just was lucky. I was just lucky. So, uh, but I, I worked late the night before. So I had <laughs> I did have a detective assigned to work under me. So when you when you're a sergeant, you have one person work for you, that's your partner. You know, you can't you can't you can't be you can't be the boss, right? Although I if, if Pete Frischer, if you're out there, Pete, I wouldn't I would yell from time to time at him. because uh, he would drive me crazy all the time on purpose. He would just do do it to the pain. And Pete uh I worked late the night before, so I just decided to do a 10 to 6 instead of an 8 to 4. I would have been right at my desk at headquarters uh, when the plane hit. And Pete calls me on the Nextel, if we can remember back to the Nextel days. And yes. uh, uh, he says, Jerry, there's a huge explosion at the World Trade Center. I'll see you there. And I was still going to do the three S's. And you have a clean show, which is poop, shower, and shave. Because, you know, from when I was in the transit squad and uh, other assignments, you you get a call in the middle of the night that there's been a double homicide or an officer involved shooting or, you know, something. You know, okay, all right. You know, I, I know what I got to do. You'd shower, you'd brush your teeth, shave, you'd put your suit on, go out, right? And I was going to do that because I was like, wow. I, I already, I, you know, I flipped on a TV as soon as I heard from Pete. Saw the image. I was like, man, this is going to be a long day. And then John Miller called me. And then John Miller was at ABC News at the time. Yep. And John calls me up and he says, Jerry, what's going on? You know, he knew my job, what job I had. And I go, John, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And I decided, it's like, you know, maybe I'll skip the shower. So I just put some deodorant on and I, and I, and I knew Bernie would want me in the building. So I took the suit I didn't like, the shirt I didn't like, the tie I didn't like. My wife handed me a cup of coffee and out I went. And I'm racing in lights and sirens like, like a, you know, hundreds of others. 
I'm behind a fire truck uh, from Rescue 5 of Staten Island. Rescue 5 has a smaller rescue truck that has like a Zodiac boat on top. And uh, uh, I followed them all the way in. I believe those two guys didn't make it. Uh, None of them did. Anybody, anybody that was working in a rescue company for the FDNY that did that they perished. Yeah. So uh, I followed them all the way in. We go through the battery tunnel. I dump my car uh, like right outside the tunnel by the battery garage, if you know that battery parking garage. And I go walking up West Street. And uh, actually, I'll, I'm going to walk this back a little bit. Was I'm, I'm on the Gowanus Expressway. We're roaring in. And all of a sudden, this guy starts screaming on the radio. It was like, he's like, and I'm listening to SOD. Oh, I'm listening to all the E-Men and everybody else that's, that's on SOD. And this guy starts screaming, oh, my God, oh, oh, but silver plane, silver plane. And, and I was like listening to 1010 Winds, and I'm listening to SOD, and I'm on the phone. And 1010 Winds was already reporting that a, a plane was hijacked out of Logan Airport. And so I'm like, okay, dude, calm down. You know, everybody now knows that a plane crashed into the tower and it was hijacked. Just because you just got here, you don't have to give us a recap. And then another cop, an email, I can't, I can't remember who it was, gets on the radio and says, Central, real calm. He said, another plane just hit the other tower. Now, I could see the towers, but I wasn't looking at the towers. I was looking over the nose of the car, driving as fast as I can. And so now I did glance over there and I see this. I didn't see the flame ball. I see it was like a ball of smoke roiling up into the sky and i'm like whoa and i'm like holy crap we're at war and like you know been on a job like we're at war war like you know so uh uh right then chief esposito joe esposito great guy what a great chief and he gets on the air so we have a like a command and control unit called operations and he says car three that's his designation and she goes with an emergency transmission, she, she goes, go ahead, car three. And he says, have operations notify the Pentagon. The city is under attack. And I'm like, I, I am telling you, I actually looked at the speaker of the, the, the radio, like not even believing the words I just heard come out of it. So I got there. Uh, I'm trying to find Carrick, uh, trying to organize what I'm going to do. The jets come, the F-15s come. This was not an air show. They, they meant they meant business. That will scare the daylights out of you, and you you could tell that they meant business. I just by the way they arrived on the scene, and then uh, I hear these booms, and I thought there were gas explosions in the building, and it turns out it was the jumpers, and that was quite uh, quite upsetting. Uh, my wife and I got our, had our wedding reception at, at Windows on the World, and uh, I went there every year on my anniversary. I got married on Valentine's Day, and uh, I was you know like. Man, I, I to tell you the truth though, I still didn't think the buildings were going to fall down at that point. I didn't. So, uh, uh, found my way around to Carrick. Took a little while to do that. Had a bunch of zigs and a bunch of zags that probably saved my life. And then he sent sent me to find Barry Morn, who's the head of the FBI office in New York. You know, there's like two thousand FBI agents in New York, and obviously we wanted to hear from the feds what they have to say about all this, and that's what Bernie wanted to know. And I went to the FBI command post and there was a guy named Danny Calamine, who's a transit guy, JTTF detective. And uh, uh, Danny like delayed me for a minute. And I was, I really want to get, get, get moving to try to find more. Danny probably saves my life. Uh, Danny probably saves my life. I get down. Uh, someone tells me he mourns in the South tower in the lobby. Morn was not in the South tower, by the way, he's still alive. Retired living up in new England someplace. And, uh, I was probably like, if you know where Century 21 is or was on Church Street, I was like right around there on Church Street when the South Tower came down. So I ran north to about the Millennium Hotel and got behind an REP, an, an ESU REP, and just waited for it. And it, it came, you know, first it was the loudest noise you've ever heard in your life. Then it's the quietest quiet you've ever heard in your life within 10 seconds of each other. And then, you know, I, I had held my breath, like a lot of people, I guess. And then I took a breath and all that, it was like flour. That's how finely pulverized all that concrete and gypsum board and glass was. Goes in, I gag, I take a reflect, a reflexive, a reflexive second breath, really screws me. I definitely was having st struggles, and uh, but there's no one to help you. I had a, you know, I ultimately figured it out. But I'll tell you, I thought I was checking out there for a minute. Uh, 
I ended up crawling a block north, a walk a block north, like can't see. I got my jacket wrapped around my head as a filter. I'm like walking like this. And I get near uh, St. Peter's Church on Barclay and Church on my friend uh, John Stewart. What I always call him a kid, but he was 17 when I met him. Man, he's he's like almost 40 now. And uh, John, a uh, 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 bunch, there were like five people in the church, and the dust was starting to settle. Now, this is after the first building, and the adults see me and say someone should get him, but none of them came out to get me. And John came out and grabbed me by the wrist, and he says, "Yo, man, you can't be out here." And I said, "Yeah, no, no, no crap, no one can be out here." And he took me into a church, and I go, "Is this a Catholic?" I go, "What is this?" He goes, "It's a church." I go, "Is it a Catholic church?" And he and uh, he goes, "I don't know. I needed water bad, and it was a Catholic church, so I was able to find the holy water just by feeling the wall. Two mouthfuls, one mouthful goggles spit. I did it again, and in one mouth, one handful on this eye, and one in the other eye, and." Uh, uh, some medic took my blood pressure. It was like two something over 170. He's like, you got to go to the hospital. I was like, dude, do you see what's going on out there? Like, <laughs> I'm not going to the hospital. I'll, I go, I'll be fine. I just need a cup of coffee, I said. <laughs> and uh, uh, I did kind of recover and realize I'm a police sergeant. I tell people what to do, whether they like it or not. And I organized everybody up in the church as best, my, best I could. And... I know we're already over an hour. I'll just say that I, this is kind of going to sound funny. With a knife given to me by Judge Lance Ito, the judge who presided over the biggest knife homicide of the 20th century gave me a knife. Mrs. Kane isn't a fan of that knife, by the way. She, she, I gave it to the kid, and we cut the priest vestments, the, the, the cloth that covers the altar. We cut all that stuff into strips. Uh let people soaked in the water, gave it to people to tie around their faces as, as they exited the church, you know, minutes later. Uh, I was in there for the collapse of the North Tower. Uh, frankly, don't remember a lot about the North Tower collapse. I can tell you, I can talk an hour and a half about the South Tower, not the North Tower. And there's a psychological reason for that. And, and it's not that I'm crazy for my friends who are watching. Uh, but I lived through it. And, uh, uh, I was down there most of the day. I was down there till after seven fell. And then uh, I ended up going back to the office, getting into a uniform. I ended up at the morgue until about three something in the morning. I went home to shower and change. And I actually was going to lay down for like a half hour just to close my eyes. And I made the mistake of putting on the TV. And even though I lived it, it was very compelling television to watch. And so I didn't even close my eyes. I just watched like, you know, the news for 30 minutes, amazed at what I was watching. And then I went back in and that morning, Pete Frischer and I recovered an American flag from like around where four world trade kind of still was. And that flag comes out every year at the beginning of the nine 11 Memorial. That's like a, a, one of the highest honors of my life. Uh, uh, that flag flew on a space shuttle. Uh, it's uh, and uh, we didn't know what to do with. We we gave it to Bernie. Bernie gave it to Rudy. Rudy gave it to NASA, and that's how that happened. I believe it also might have flown at Yankee Stadium during the World Series um, that that October, as as well. Because I remember Joe Buck mentioning it. If you go back, it's on YouTube. If you watch Game Three, which the Yankees won two to one, Roger Clemens went seven strong innings that night. Um, it's they pan out to it at one point because it had been going around to the funerals of various of the 23 cops that had been killed. And we'll hit on a few more things. We'll, we'll try to keep it to 90 minutes and I'll have okay. to bring you back for other experiences too, because you've been great tonight. We'll, we'll definitely do a part two, but just a few more things before we get out is you knew so many of these guys, you knew, of course, Joe Vigiano. I've heard, I've seen you tell stories about him on LinkedIn. It's not just him. It's obviously Marty Egan who had done the rollover. I talked about what the rollover was previously. He'd been, a, I think he'd been a cop prior, and then he went over to the FD like a lot of guys. He was always FD. His dad was a cop. No, oh, okay. It's my, my apologies. He was FD. That's a guy. You knew him. You know, and you know they're down there, but it's difficult because it's not like Tony Dwyer that at least you can see Tony. You know, you can try to help him as best you can. You know that buried underneath all this are your friends, but you just it's physically impossible to get in there. Oh. So for as far as those leading from that until you left in 2005, it's still so recent. It's still so raw. Those early. I mean, no anniversary is easy, 
But at least as time goes on, it gets a little bit easier to deal with. Those first few anniversaries are rough. What helped you recover? Not physically. Those go away with time. Mentally. Well, I'll tell you. I think I did something for myself. There's two things. Mm -hmm. First, believe it or not, I think going through the experience with Tony Dwyer in 1989. Right. That was a very, very rough year. It was a you know it was a horrible thing to go through, and then we kind of a year later we had the trial right. So you're reliving the whole thing again. Yes. And the uh, there's a there's a physical component to PTSD and, and survivor guilt and whatever else you want to call it, right? And and you I didn't recognize it then, but you you can feel it coming. And so after 9-11, when I would feel that. I could actually kn know it's coming. So when you know something's coming, you can do things mentally to kind of stiff arm it, keep it at bay. Uh, so I, I had, I believe in, I, I think Tony was like an angel on my shoulders, uh, uh, making sure that I was, you know, I, I kind of got through it all right. And the other part is when I was standing on in front of the Marriott World Trade Center, you know, there were two Marriott hotels. One is still there and the other one was totally destroyed. Yeah, I was standing in front of the one that was ended up to be totally destroyed, and the jets are screaming overhead, and the people were jumping out of the windows, and it landed on West Street. And I actually had a there was a, a deputy commissioner who was having a panic attack. I was trying to get that guy to calm down, I, you know, because we got a lot of things on our, our plate, and I can't have this guy having a panic attack. And uh, I made a, a like a, a, a purposeful thought in my head that there was so much going on. It was just too much for a human being to absorb. So I thought to myself, if I can't touch it, I'm not going to put in too much brain power into it. Like, I can't do anything for these people jumping. There's, I got nothing to do with these jet fighters overhead or any other planes that might be in route. I I, 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 I can't do anything up, up on a 70th or 80th floor right now. But if you were down here, and like I would take people and turn them this way and turn them that way and turn them this way, Give, yell at them, tell them to go that way. If I can have direct contact with you, either verbally or put my hands on you, I will put some brain power to that. Other than that, I was trying not to dwell on it because like, it would have been easy just to go like, like look up and it just be you know, overwhelmed with everything that was happening. And I think that that decision I made, and it wasn't like I was some you know super smart guy. It was just something I kind of came up with that day. Uh, I think that helped me. I really do. Uh, you know, I don't know. If, listen, I, I might be nuttier than anybody that you ever met, but uh, uh, oh no, I, you're not. Believe me, I've be, <laughs> besides this show, I have some uh, characters that I come across in my life. Actually, I've, I, I've seen your guests. Uh, some of them are crazier than me. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think those two things. I think my experience with Tony, and uh, I think my uh, and I think my. Uh, uh, my decision to just concentrate on what I can actually touch uh, uh, helped. Uh, I might be wrong, but I, I I do think that that's what. That's no, you're not the only one that said that because there have been certain people that said, you know, I remember one of my friends saying um, that as far as the jumpers were concerned, listen, I'm not going to look. I'm just going to control my psyche. I'll only see what I need to see here. Um, can you close your ears? No, but you can definitely control what you see. Um, and that's, I guess, you know, it goes back to a line that the emergency service cops like to say, which is know your job, do your job. Um, and I guess that's that's the essence of the job for both the FD and the PD. So I guess this brings us to the end of the show. I'll get to the concluding segment momentarily. But you get to 05, you leave in 05. And now, as you were talking about, it's been 17 years since you've left. When you look back on what was such a full plate of a career that we didn't even scratch the surface of, I feel tonight, which is why I'm going to have to bring you back for a part two down the road. What are you proud of stuff? So uh, when I was at Midtown North, uh, I was a stew sergeant and uh, our guys develop information on this drug dealer named Fat Jim. You know, they, they rolled up a dealer. The dealer talked. He goes, I get my supply from Fat Jim. Fat Jim, by the way, was a fat guy named Jim, right? He was uh, <laughs> Uh, of course. Uh, 400. Oh, Jerry cut out there for a little bit. We'll wait for him to come back. Thank you guys for being here, by the way. You guys are very loyal. I'll shout you out in a moment. I'm just going to wait for Jerry to get back here. Okay, he's back. Sorry okay. about that. So if you ever bought a house, it's all, it's all consuming. You're thinking about it night and day. You're going to empty your bank account out to buy this house. 
you know, it's, it's, it, it, you literally, the last thing you think of before you go to sleep, first thing you think of when you wake up. Mm -hmm. And I thought my bank was, was, was jerking me around about the mortgage. And in the morning of this fat gym search warrant, my wife goes, you should call Dennis, Dennis's dad. Um, my friend Dennis, Midtown South Cop, his dad was the president of a, a small bank in Brooklyn. I'm like, I can't call him. He's the president of a bank. And she's like, nah, he loves you. He thinks you're funny. And I'm like, I, I can't call him. I don't know. I, I'll go, I'll think about it. Maybe I'll call Dennis. So I go in that day and I'm going to do, have to run a TAC meeting. So I'm going to have ESU there because they're going to do the entry. Regular narcotics, you know, SNU is like junior narcotics, right? Regular right. narcotics going to be there. I got my SNU guys. Patrol is going to be there, of course, to help us. And Inspector Smoker, who's the great guy, who's the precinct commander, who's, uh, comes to me and goes, Jerry, uh, the police foundation has a couple of fat cats with me today. Uh, it's commanding officer for a day. I have to show them around. I'm going to have them come and sit in on a TAC meeting, but I'm not going to bring them out to the entry. I go, yeah, no problem, Inspector. So I'm doing this TAC meeting, and I look in the back of the room, and there is Dennis's dad. And I thought I was hallucinating. I swear to God. So... Uh, after the meeting, I, I come up, to, I say hello to him, and he goes, Jerry, that was great, blah, blah, blah. He's, like, really positive. And I tell him, I go, you know, Madeline and I were talking about you this morning. I was having coffee. He goes, well, he goes why? I go, ah, I'm buying a house, and I'm not sure if the bank's doing the right thing. He gives me his card. He says, call my secretary, writes her name on the back of the card, and he looks at me and goes, you're getting your mortgage from my bank. And I did. And everything went real smooth. You know, when the president of the bank is looking out after you, there's, like, no problems, right? No hiccups. <laughs> so that's not the end of that story, though. There was a girl in the apartment, and she was definitely a user. She was definitely down on her luck. We arrested her because there were a lot of drugs in the apartment. And she kind of pulled on the heartstrings of me and the team. I'm going to throw out the names of the team. It was uh, Rocky Patelli, uh, Pat Ferguson, Luigi Alinto, uh, uh, Mike Gargan, uh, and myself. And uh, so we uh, – I go to the guys. I go, look, when you go downtown, talk to the, the district attorney – and see, Manhattan District Attorney's Office has a lot of money because of all the Wall Street cases they do. They kind of like, the ADA kind of like has sympathy for her too. And they put her in a rehab program and it, like for 60 days. That's a lot of money. And she gets out and she gets uh, 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 released, uh, contemplating dismissal. She stays out of trouble for a year and her case goes away. We ultimately got Fat Jim, locked up Fat Jim for all the felony drugs, and I don't even know what happened with his case. Like, 17 years later, 18 years later, I'm sitting right where I am right now, and my phone rings. It's Texas. And this this woman, I'll call her June, calls up and says, I answer the phone, Jerry Kane. She goes, are you the Sergeant Kane who used to be the new sergeant in Midtown North in 1987? And I go, yeah. And she goes, you might not remember me, but I am. And she tells me who she is. And I stop her. I go, I know exactly who you are. I remember exactly. Well, she tells me she got clean. She was pregnant. Her son was graduating high school that year, a year early. He was an Eagle Scout, and he was going into the Navy to become an air traffic controller. She was a volunteer EMT. She owned a swimming school, and she donated swimming school lessons to kids with autism because she lives in a state with a gazillion swimming pools and these autistic kids need to know how to swim because they could fall into a pool at any time so she turned her life 180 degrees around she had a great great kid and uh so she her and a kid came up before he went to boot camp and i got the whole team back together we were all retired actually one guy was two guys were still on the job and uh we went out for a big steak and had a lot of laughs and we stayed in touch now and who gets who gets to retire and then hear from someone you arrested almost two decades ago that you saved their life and saved their unborn child's life and that they're both living their best life now. So it's not all death and sadness and misery. There are good stories out there. And that I, I got one. And that makes me a lucky guy. So there you go. Jerry, this has been wonderful. It is now time, and don't sign off yet. We'll say goodbye off the air for a segment of this podcast called Rapid Fire. And that's the highlight of the show right there, by the way. I'm gonna, that's the, that, when you see me tweet out the clips in the morning on LinkedIn the following day, that's going to be the clip I'm tweeting out. So just so you know, heads up. Uh, rapid Fire, of course, consists, as you know, of watching the show. Five hit run questions from me, five answers from you. Are you ready? I am ready. 
Okay, so first thing you loved most about working in Manhattan. Oh God, it's it's the best. It's the absolute best place there is. Uh, uh, you get to meet gazillionaires, movie stars, and of course, you yep. also have the worst of the worst. The, like not the worst of the worst. The people that need your help the most, right? Uh, okay. People with absolutely don't even have two cents to rub together, right? Uh, so many people that that need uh, someone to come along in their life and 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 help them. So, uh, uh, no, you know, no offense to my brothers and sisters from the outer boroughs, but only Manhattan gets to do that. So, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Second most up, well, besides the one you just shared, most uplifting call you've ever been on. Uh, delivered a baby once uh, in a morning yeah. hotel. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, actually, I walked in. This woman had like a five year old. The five year old looks at me like this, like all cocky, going like, "You better hurry up," and like. I, you know, I like, I like to joke and tell people that I called for the curve, but she was pitching a fastball almost like, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was, you, you know, who got, you know, that was like, that was a nice thing. I, I listen, I've had kids, I've seen kids b born before, but, uh, to, mm -hmm. you know, to just glove up basically in, uh, the Marty Cotel and deliver a baby was pretty, pretty interesting. So only in New York third funniest folks you've ever worked with, uh, you diver midtown South. Every Midtown South guy who's watching this now just started laughing. You dive 100%. <laughs> Fourth, favorite bar or restaurant in New York City? Oh, that's tough, man. <laughs> uh, you say multiple? Okay. So uh, my favorite uh, Manhattan bar is Twins Pub by Midtown South. My favorite uh, Bay Ridge bar is Pippin's Pub near my house. Favorite Italian restaurant, Brooklyn, Gino's in Bay Ridge in Manhattan is Forlini's right by court. Go Forlini's. Spend many, many hours there. Uh, favorite steakhouse? is going to be either Peter Luger's or Keen's or Smith and Walensky's or Del Frisco's or Uncle Jack's. See, that's a lot of good steakhouses, isn't there? So a lot of them I need to try and I've heard of some of them, but I've never been, you know, cause uh, I'm on that college graduate budget, which is to say, I'm not, I'm not rocking with much, you know, I can, but eventually, eventually one day, we'll, we'll, you know, get, we'll, get nice we'll, we'll put you on what we used to call, uh, like when you wanted to go out and get someone else to pay, we'll put you on scholarship. <laughs> I appreciate it, of course. Fifth and finally, if you could speak to a cop that just graduated the academy and get his and is getting ready to start his or her career, given your experiences on the job, what advice would you give them? I'd say, of course, always wear your vest, right? Number two, uh, you know, look out for each other, back each other up. Three, uh, uh, make sure you're in uh, all of the good retirement things like deferred compensation. You want to retire one day and have money in the bank. Uh, uh, four, stay curious. And five for your career, the job the job will forgive a lot of things. I had I I you know I got jammed up twice, once for the Tomka Square Park riot, once for shooting at a car. You're not allowed to shoot at cars. Uh, I wrecked cars. I was on a civilian complaint review list. I was on a high overtime list. The one thing that they got mad at me, I was once on the chronic sick list one year. And every interview I went on, you would have thought I like stole money from this guy's own house. All these guys, uh, when you when you go for the interview, they don't care about any of the other stuff because they all, they all either did that stuff or had really good friends who had the, the same things. They hate chronic sick. Don't go chronic sick. Don't ever go chronic sick. There you go. There you go. Well, this has been great. Like I said, I'll shout out the audience in a moment. Of course, any shout outs that you want to give to anyone or anything before we sign off? Uh, yeah. I, you know, I just say, listen to all the, all the cops out there anywhere in any jurisdiction, you never know when, uh, you're gonna, it's gonna happen. Uh, just, just keep, just be safe. And to all us retirees, uh, please, please, please live many, many, many years collecting the pension because you've earned it. Absolutely. I concur. Well, of course, my shout out as always is to first you, you were fantastic. Uh, you were an absolutely good, phenomenal guest, and I will bring you back, like I said earlier, for part two at some point. Shout out to the audience in order. It is Bill Ryan from Arson Explosion, Tales from the Boom Room, Profiles of the NYPD's Arson Explosion, Bomb Squad co-creator, Mike Kane, retired FDNY Fire Marshal, of course, Adam Waxman, Brian Keller. Uh, we got Peter Pranzo. He's here. Raquel Pranzo's here as well. John Latanzio, three truck guy from ESU, Howard Blank, Taru guy retired. Uh, Maui Swift, of course, we got her. Uh, thank you, Mario, as always, for supporting the show. Alex Stillman's here. We got Steve-O. He remembers you as well. Steve-O's here. Uh, and we got, uh, let's see, well, that's, that covers everybody. So coming up next on the Mike and Maven podcast, Friday might be a doubleheader. I'm working to see. But I do know one guest that certainly is guaranteed for volume 14. 
of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite, retired FDNY, rescue two and rescue one Lieutenant Mike Penna. That should be a really good show. Mike had a lot of fun, of course, in rescue two in Brooklyn and rescue one in Manhattan. As we were talking about working in Manhattan, he saw and got to do quite a few cool things. So Mike will be here for sure. If I get another guest for that double header, I'll let you know who it is. It's going to be a big one if I can get her and I'll leave it at that. So in the meantime, on behalf of retired NYPD Sergeant Jerry Kane, I am Mike Cologne. Have a great night, everybody. We will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you.